Welcome to The Rot Focus, a podcast for rotters, newbies, and veterans, and everyone in between. We're hosted by M.A. Lee with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Rooms, all from Rotters Inc. Books. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Each episode lasts as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, grab a short commute, or take a brisk walk. Resources and links are in the show notes. Visit us at therockfocus.blogspot.com. Now, on to this week's episode. What do writers want to know about plot? What do writers need to know about plot? The right focus is taking a comprehensive view of plot, the structure that develops characters, genre expectations, major story structures, pacing, tension, suspense. We cover it all in this series entitled Discovering Your Plot from M.A. Lee's Godbook of the Same Name. Writers will discover unexpected insights and methods that deepen their understanding of this major craft in the storytelling world. Genre expectations are reader expectations. With all the books on the shelf, a classification system, more than fiction and nonfiction, is necessary. Here comes genre to save the day, like Mighty Mouse of the famous cartoon. We have ten major genres of fiction and countless subgenres within each category. And then we have stories that fuse genres or bend the genre boundaries. As long as we interest, amuse, or instruct our readers, that's all that matters. Genre is defined as a category of literature. Walk into a bookstore or browse an online distributor. Very quickly, we encounter the broad categories that help sort books into manageable groups. On one side is nonfiction, cookbooks self-help finance, self-help psychology. Fiction crowds the other side, literary, contemporary, local interest, mysteries, fantasies, and science fiction side by side with horror and a small bank of shelves devoted to westerns. The big box booksellers have larger areas, but the same format. The local super grocery has a whole aisle, same format, all crammed with print magazines. When my former town lost its last local book retailer in the mall, the major drugstore had few offerings of books, slowly whittled down over the seasons to only best-selling authors. Gradually, the town acquired a couple of used bookstores, but my buying went online, depending first on a catalog put out by an aggregate distributor and then to an online book distributor. The drugstore and grocery shelving for books is vanishing. The big retailers are vanishing, sped on by our plague year. The small independent bookstores are returning and still classify books by genre. Genre classification helps readers find books. It's the first selling point. The second most important selling point for books is the covered, followed by the title and market copy, Market copy is on the back or beneath the book's cover called a blurb. The fourth selling point, length, which we discussed in the last section, major genres of literature. A simple internet search will bring up a comprehensive list of the genres for fiction and nonfiction. Another few clicks will find a list of the tropes generally associated with that genre and an average page and word count based on that writing. Remember, an average simply means some books are longer and some are shorter. It's like an average lifespan, not a predetermined required number. The average lifespan in 1600 England was between 30 and 40 years of age, 35. Shakespeare, born in 1564, died in 1616 at the age of 52, 17 years beyond the average. That only means that someone else would have died at 18. 
Elizabeth I was 70 at her death, born 1533, and died 1603. The same averages work with manuscript length. One mystery might run 83,000 words, while another runs 58,000, giving an average manuscript length of 70,500 words. Each book has its own organic development. Project a length, but don't destroy the story or your creativity by forcing a specific point of the story to a specific page number or percentage. Whichever genre that we choose, we should remember that great literature contains both humorous moments and tragic ones, the pathos. William Shakespeare was a master of breaking the tightening to suspense with levity before ratcheting the tension even tighter. Most writers do practice a fusion of genre categories rather than sticking to the tropes of a single one. This increases their reading market, but categorization in a bookstore and with an online distributor can slide around, making that fused story more difficult to locate. Subgenres flood the major categories. Many writers divide the subcategories into narrow units. For example, under romance is the Gothic novel. The original Gothic novel intertwines romance, horror, and death in a decaying setting, usually a crumbling castle or a monastery. The first Gothic, The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, blended the fantastical with the supernatural and utilized many of the tropes that became common, secret passages and trap doors, ghosts and ancestral curses, a mysterious dark mentor, threatening mysteries, and fainting heroines, this is the classic Gothic of which Edgar Allan Poe was a practitioner. The Southern Gothic novel, as practiced by William Faulkner in his classic A Rose for Emily, or Tennessee Williams's Suddenly Last Summer, concerns the decaying lifestyle of the post-Civil War American South. Common tropes of the Southern Gothic include A. Vanished wealth, while B. Social status remains high. C. Aberrant thought processes caused from D. Warped viewpoint of the descendants of the previous slave owners. And E. Mysterious twisted behavior by or enacted upon characters. The Gothic romance of the 1950s to 1970s, now called the Vintage Gothic, often depicted a terrified woman running from a castle or other imposing building. Popular writers of this genre were Victoria Holt, Phyllis A. Whitney, Mary Stewart, Barbara Michaels, and Dorothy Eden. The protagonist may have recently married the wealthy heir to the castle. Her arrival at his home would set in motion a series of dangerous events designed to kill her, and she escapes death several times. No one believes she is in danger, especially at the beginning, and several people suggest that she is hysterical or needy. She is not believed until she survives a wounding attack, and sometimes not even then. The protagonist does not know whom she can trust. Even her brooding husband is not trustworthy. Thus, within each genre subcategory, we find other subgenres and fused genres and micro-genres. Many best-selling writers transcend original genre classification. The horror genre was once classified with other speculative fiction, science fiction, and fantasy. Stephen King's success warranted the genre receiving its own separate bank of shelves. Now King has transcended genre categorization, which simply means that he shelved where buyers will easily find his newest titles and the older titles still available. King draws people into the bookstore rather than books drawing people in, then covers and story blurbs attracting the sale. All genres have at their heart the conflict of order versus chaos. How the novel disrupts that core feature often determines its classification, yet even that core expectation can be broken within the genre. First genre, classic. These are stories belonging to the literary canon. 
Think Charles Dickens and A Christmas Story, Jane Austen and William Shakespeare. Second, the modern literary novel. These are written primarily to explore character angst, which is why I stay away from them. Most are concerned with what destroys people's lives. Usually the plot does not resolve the chaotic events. No order may emerge from the traumas of life. Literary fiction is often dependent upon the idea that people are searching for meaning in a meaningless world, and they won't find it. A definition of modernism that I encountered so long ago that I can no longer find the original reference. A literary novel may be heavily dependent on irony, which is the difference between expectation and reality, or appearance versus truth. Think Ernest Hemingway or Arthur Miller. Third genre, Slice of Life, a novel of the present time, often classed as women's fiction or Christian fiction or a similar niche market, distinguished from the modern literary novel in that the climax for the protagonist will resolve order from the chaos. Think Jan Karen's Father Tim series. Fourth genre, the historical Our Family Saga. These novels explore a past era through characters, sometimes dramatized from reality. The family saga covers several generations as the family members deal with historical events. No happy ever after ending is guaranteed, even as the readership craves it. Think Downton Abbey. Many of Jean Plady's books on the Queens of England fit this category, although some do slide into the historical romance subgenre. Selecting the category depends upon the relationship focus. Whichever category is selected, however, Plady's number of titles in the historical genre caused all of her books to be classified in the historical shelves, while her Victoria Holt titles were firmly in the romance shelving. Plady and Holt are both pseudonyms of Eleanor Hibbert, who had even more pen names than that. Fifth genre, mystery. The mystery genre includes crime detective or police procedural. Think Tony Hillerman, Cozy, Thriller, and Suspense, Mary Stewart or Phyllis A. Whitney. The Cozy Mystery is an example of the changing definition of the subgenre. As practiced by Agatha Christie, the Cozy involved a small group of people in an enclosed setting. The modern definition of Cozy requires humor and may not even have a murder such as Anne B. Ross's Miss Julia series. Sixth genre, romance. The genres in romance would fill an entire bookstore, and those subgenres help romance be the strongest market with the most loyal readership of any literary categorization. Whatever type of story, fairy tale with a strong fantasy element such as Robin McKinley, futuristic science fiction, mixed with paranormal, straight romantic historical, such as Jean Plady, historical romantic suspense, or any of the many, many others. The primary focus of any book in the romance genre is the relationship developing between the primary characters. Most romances will have a happily ever after, H-E-A, ending, although some are classified as H-F now, happy for now. Seventh genre, fantasy. Often shelved with science fiction under the old heading of speculative fiction, but now simply SFF. Fantasy requires magical events and magical creatures, often from various cultures around the world. The folk tale, the fairy tale, straddles the line between fantasy and mythology. Supernatural elements, vampires and shapeshifters, will sometimes cause a story to be classified as mythology, sometimes as fantasy, and occasionally as paranormal romance. A sub-genre of fantasy is the fable mythology, while having humans as primary characters in legendary or historical events. This will involve godlike beings in the story. A fable is a tale with fantastical elements that reveals a concluding truth. Next, eight we have science fiction. Set in the near or far future, science fiction includes many extraterrestrials, such as Close Encounters of the Third Time, 
Are science beyond current capabilities? Jurassic Park. Tech or science is a key element of science fiction. Most people think Star Trek when they think of the science fiction genre. Star Wars adds in the old space opera genre. Alternate history fits into this category. Steampunk straddles fantasy and science fiction. Some authors meld fantasy with science fiction. Anne McCaffrey's Pern novels about the dragon riders of Pern read in publication order, they're fantasy. Read in chronological order, they start as science fiction. Ninth genre, horror. While most people think gore when they consider the horror genre, the only primary element is dread through terrifying events. Ghost stories belong in the horror genre. Poltergeist is an on-target example. Depending on approach, vampires and werewolves belong in this genre. An American werewolf in London is solidly horror. An interview with a vampire reads more like fantasy because dread does not fill the pages. And lastly, 10th, action adventure. This genre includes the niche markets of westerns, swashbucklers, pulp detectives, which have less mystery solving than fighting action. Military thrillers could fit in this category, but sometimes wind up in mystery. Alastair MacLean, who penned the World War II books, Where Eagles Dare and the Guns of Navarone, along with the race car thriller, The Way to Dusty Death, was shelved in mystery. Tom Clancy's The Hunt for Red October belongs in action adventure, but a big marketing push from his publisher kept it in the center promotion aisles. Comics and graphic novels, stories related through drawings or other pictures with only a few words, usually belong in this category of action adventure, although Neil Gaiman's The Graveyard Book was classified with fantasy. Thanks for listening to The Rock Focus, a podcast for writers at all levels, hosted by Emma Lee from Writers Inc. Books, assisted by Remy Black and Edie Runes. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Music is licensed through Audio Jungle called Background Music Loop. Its creator is Alexander Polishchuk, known on Audio Jungle as Plastic 3. The music comes in different iterations. Show notes and resource links for this and other episodes can be found at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at winkbooks at aol.com when you have questions, comments, and speculations. We will try to answer you as quickly as possible. By the way, we will not mind your email address. That's rude. If you find value in our content, share with your writing friends or write a review. We're small beans here without the advertising budget of the big peeps and you can make a difference. And whatever occurs, write on. Welcome to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers, newbies, 